Welcome. This is the Do It All Dad Year podcast. Dad friendly entertainment for you and me. Controlling our kids through comedy can make our kids great again. And I am your host, Michael Kornbluth. And this is episode 17. My Trump audition reel for the White House Correspondents Dinner. But before we get to that, I just want to uh, talk about Kanye West for a second. So he just released a new song. It's called Ye Vs. The People. And this is what I have to say about that. Ye Vs. The People by Kanye isn't mind-blowing prose. Calm down, Trump Nation. As far as I'm concerned, Kanye is still hitting Obama with kitty gloves on. Where's LL Cool J when you need him? Saw my younger brother yesterday. Uh, we had a huge makeup love fest. I love you, bro. I'm so glad you're in my life again. And I love your future fiance. Not ruining any surprises there. Her name is Jane. Very easy to remember. Sweet Jane. Very sweet. She loved my Lena Dunham jokes. So this bond is already impossible to break. She went to Tulane University. She's a musician. She teaches, e she teaches ESL. That's English for a second language. So basically, most likely the language that the uh, people climbing the wall over in San Diego right now have no intention of learning anytime this millennium, but I like to be wrong. So I love you already, Jane, for making my brother a very happy man and for inspiring him to be his best, most sweet, loving, non-sketchy self imaginable. Gave him a nice toast yesterday. This beautiful farm down the street called Harvest Moon. Pretty sure my toast was to falling in love again. So I don't have a drink in my hand right now, but I think it's worthwhile and more than appropriate to give you another toast right now on my podcast, which is a labor of love. Also effortless as far as my love for my brother and for you now, Jane. So congratulations again, Mazel Tov and Lakayan to falling in love again. So hang on my brother. And he mentioned, uh, Paul, I don't know, we're talking about Paul McCartney. And uh, he told me that Paul McCartney loves the nose candy. He loves the yay, the nose candy, any acronym you want to use to describe the booger sugar, the yayo, the cocaine, whatever. So my brother says, Paul McCartney loves the nose candy. And I said, so that's how he stays a vegetarian. So we are going to talk about uh, the roast the White House Correspondents' Dinner that Trump had blown off last night so he could attend a rally in, uh, in Colorado, uh, which I think is really fantastic. But So I plan on completely uh, dumping on the, this host uh, that you've never heard of before called uh, Michelle uh, Wolf, who was at the White House Correspondents' Dinner. She was the host, the MC, And I had no intention of writing jokes today. I had no intention of putting together a podcast, but all it takes is a hack comedian repeating tired punchlines regarding Russian collusion and pussy grabbage. All it takes is for me to read a couple of these jokes on a Sunday after reading on Twitter that the so-called comedian destroyed President Trump and Press Secretary Sarah Huckabee Sanders. So that's all it took to get my creative juices flowing. And I didn't require a team of 25 writers to help me out with these A-plus gems that I'm going to spoil my loyal audience listeners with right now. So let's get this party started, right? And this is for you, Trump and Sarah. So if Sarah Sanders is such a big, fat liar, then why do any CNN viewers left still have gaga eyes for Jim Acosta? Also, calling Jim Acosta a media personality is like calling The Handmaid's Tale a dark comedy or Michelle Wolf, Joan Rivers' light on the jokes. So my in-laws were just here. I pour my mother-in-law a nice glass of Sauvignon Blanc. She says, ooh, I forgot to bring wine. I say, sure you did. Like the three times you blanked after your three grandchildren were born. But it's your pathetic effort to mask your cheapness, which counts. So this is a uh, prime example of my firstborn, Matilda Rose Cornbooth, prime example of my daughter 
bashing Baba for Dada. Here we go. Baba loves their dog more than us, Dada. She pays for its daycare, but never Arthur's. Takes the dog out for more strolls than baby Samuel. Forces me to do grace when she knows I'm Jewish. As if my timing isn't a dead giveaway. So I'm in the car uh, with my daughter and my two sons. We're coming back from playing basketball at the park. Whip my brother's ass. Had a very valiant comeback. Uh, I was He was beating me. He was like H-O-R-S to like nothing. And I did not choke. Made adjustments in my stroke. Made sure I used my legs. Just trying to throw up pointers there. This is a Do It All Daddy podcast. I do want to empower the young uh, aspirational males uh, for our future. So I th- I would never share this with my wife and I don't plan on her listening to the podcast anytime this millennium, even if I was making money off it. But the point being is I, I said to my daughter, I said, well, should we pick up mama for Harvest Moon or should we just go straight to Harvest Moon? She goes, go straight to Harvest Moon. And then I said, Matilda, are you saying that because mom will be a buzzkill and get jealous of me laughing up with Uncle John? And my daughter says, yes. And of course I'm thinking, daughter knows best. Daughter knows best. So a benefit of being an unemployed father of three is I can continue to ridicule the Sheehy Obamas, Hillary Hammertime Kankles, etc. Because I'm not plagued by the I'll lose my job excuse. <laughs> no wonder my jokes are so evolved compared to other edgeless, lame pros these days. And I was talking about my daughter bashing Baba before. Um, who We had this uh, humorous exchange. We were at the uh, playground earlier today after McDonald's and my daughter had done this very valiant jump off the swing. Perfect landing. I was emoting big time. And my younger son, Arthur, who gets very competitive, decided to jump almost at the exact same time off the swing. Now, he landed on the ground, but it was a very smooth crash landing. There was it was not a trace of putziness anywhere near his vicinity. He was fuss free. So I started cheering him on too. I was really getting into it. I like to overcompensate for uh, my father's shortcomings in the uh, positive reinforcement department. So with that said, all of a sudden, this like other kid, I don't know, he's six, I have no idea. He appears and he's looking completely freaked out by my torrential downpour of like positivity that my children are very fortunate to be the recipients of. And then out of nowhere, I basically called the moment and I said to the kid, I said, you know, normally dads don't emote around here. I get it, kid. You know, most dads at playgrounds are dead men walking. And the kid's mother or au pair, she was blonde. So I'm like assuming she's maybe an au pair. Started laughing. Long time. So that was a nice moment. So... I was talking about that uh, the swing, and I'm just so tired of hearing about, oh, Sarah Huckabee Sanders. She is a liar. She organizes Trump's lies. She shields his lies. I'm sick of it. Trump's a liar, blah, blah, blah. Because Barack Obama is the mensch who used fake probable cause to spy on the Trump campaign and cast lingering doubt on the legitimacy of a duly elected American president. Also, Trump's college records aren't sealed in a fortress of solitude either, last time I checked. It's a true fact. Uh, You guys can look it up right now. All of Barack Obama's college records are sealed. In fact, uh, James Woods recently did some stunt where I think he paid someone to conduct random interviews at Columbia University to ask if anyone has any recollection of, you know, Barack Obama, you know, ever attending school there, which is pretty comical. I I love it when you hear this. I don't like Trump because he isn't worth as much money as he proclaims. But take offense at me pointing out how non-money Obama actually is. That's a sign of a real mature, uh, functioning, evolved uh, adult in this day and age, don't you think? 
Jim Acosta complaining about President Trump's attacks on the press is like a heckler bitching about getting bitch slapped on the bigger stage mic again and again and again. Jim Acosta bitching about Trump's attacks on CNN is like Governor Jerry Brown complaining about Trump letting El Guapo fund UC Berkeley moving forward. Instead of relying on Carlos Mencia's writing residuals from the Writers Guild of America, obviously. You need to understand that he's a notorious joke thief to really appreciate the, uh, the full thrusted awesome power of that joke jam right now. Jim Acosta bitching about President Trump's attacks on the press is like Stormy Daniels complaining about getting blindsided by too many money shots in rapid succession. Ba pow, ba pow, ba pow. I need to get me. Ba pow. I don't get paid up for this. Ba pow. Memo to Michelle Woof Woof Wolf. Ivanka Trump helping her dad form and pass a bill intent on ending child sex trafficking is worth more than a box of empty tampons. Then again, I get the impression nobody would pay for your services anyway. But that's besides the point. Jim Acosta again. Jim Acosta bitching about Trump's attacks on CNN is like Sarah Silverman complaining about her rotting eggs inside. It's called but true. Sarah Silverman would not think it's sad. And uh, that's true. And I used to really like Sarah Silverman. And the, uh, I'm not being facetious. She was very funny. The uh, Michelle Wolf is only 32. Turns out Michelle Wolf, host of the White House Correspondents' Dinner, is only 32. Too bad her raggedy and 80s perm is more dated than her Russian collusion pussy grabbage jokes. Plus, Michelle Wolf exudes less sex appeal than a goat on an Adam Sandler record, the Golden Jew. Sandler is host equals Oscars gold. Wrote that blog about eight years ago. I think it stands true more than ever. This is what Trump says in response to the White House Correspondents' Center. He says, Greg Gutfeld, good old Greg Gutfeld, former editor of Maxim, Trump says Greg Gutfeld should host the White House Correspondents' Dinner next year. Meanwhile, Patton Oswald is suffering from cardiac arrest, shouting on the shitter. He's not even a comedian! James Woods thinks I'm way funnier. And more adorable to look at. Also, Michelle Wolf making fun of any woman's looks is like expecting Lena Dunham to be a neutral judge for a wet t-shirt contest in Daytona Beach in the 80s. Who complains about Spud McKenzie not acknowledging her blemish blobby body? I was going to go with blemish, blemish, blobby bod, but body blemish... Blobby body just works. But it is a mouthful. Kim Kardashian can't wrap her mouth around it. No offense, Kanye, like I said it before. All that joke means is that Kanye, not Kanye, but it means that Kim Kardashian is that one with uh, glorious, uh, super studded black schlongage. So these jokes were just absolutely brutal. And what I mean by brutal at this White House Correspondent Center, I mean so surely unfunny. Like, this is funny. Jim Acosta bitching about Trump's attacks on CNN is like Chelsea Clinton bitching about the wonders of... <laughs> this is what I get for jerking myself off for a setup before I do a joke. I am worse right now than Anthony Jelsonek. Let's try this again. Jim Acosta bitching about Trump's attacks on CNN is like Chelsea Clinton bitching about the wonders of Mother Time's ability to heal her face. If I were to share that joke with my wife right now, she would say that joke is sexist. Then I would say, babe, that's an unfair accusation, okay? Chelsea Clinton, she's not even ugly anymore. Plus, for the record, I think Alyssa Milano is a divisive 
twat on Twitter too. And you can take that to the bank. People laugh at that because it's true. Michelle Wolf reminds me of a woman who claims to be half black to get into the comedy diversity writing program at Warner Brothers because she obviously needs all the extra assistance she can get because it's unfair to be born such an unfunny butterface. Also, Michelle Wolf making fun of any girl's looks is like Chelsea Handler making fun of anybody's drinking problem or James Woods making fun of Mark Zuckerberg's blah, 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 blah. Let's try that uh, blah, 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 again. Michelle Wolf making fun of any girl's looks is like Chelsea Handler making fun of anybody's drinking problem or like James Woods making fun of Mark Zuckerberg's acne scars of shame. Glad we finally got that out of our system and it didn't take too long. So I love it when I hear uh, Trump is the Antichrist. I, I would have liked to have heard uh, Michelle Wolf's attempt to ex extrapolate humor from that uh, dated ridiculous premise. Trump is the Antichrist. Trump is the Antichrist. But in the Bible part two, Jesus returns from heaven and destroys the Antichrist without breaking a sweat. So my only message to all of you Trump resistor fanatics out there is have a little faith in the Jesus comeback story. Won't you people? The sad part is that I am a degenerate um, Jew that actually had to Google Antichrist at first to figure out what the hell that actually meant when everyone started calling Trump the Antichrist after he got elected. Because at the time, I just thought, well, that's what pig vomit calls Howard Stern and private parts, so it can't be that bad. Which is true. The uh, Reverend Bob Levy was a big fan of that uh, one-liner uh, down the road. So, this is the Do It All Dad Year podcast. Dad-friendly entertainment for you and me. Controlling our kids through comedy can make our kids great again. And I want to thank God for my brother falling in love again. That's a beautiful thing. His future fiance was married before. And I found out that uh, her older brother uh, was born in the year of the dragon, like myself, 1976. So we definitely share that same uh, dragon energy, which is a beautiful thing. And, you know, it's a rare thing to fall in love again. What Charles Palmerity in Bronxdale says, you know, we're lucky to have three ladies, three special women. True story. When I'm in Los Angeles, I'm in Sherman Oaks. I had this dream. I usually don't remember dreams. My vision was that I would meet my lucky number three on an island. And this island was going to be the island of Manhattan. And we had Katie King in Cape Cod. And like my insight was that I met every woman that changed my life for the better, where there was some love formation uh, you know, within us both. So there was Katie in Cape Cod. First time I ever talked to God that summer. In Gulf of Sanus. It was always romantic at heart. Would always listen to Ario Speedwagon, listen to the soft rock radio on my bedtime clock radio at night. I used to request Look Away by Chicago. I had my slow dance partners. I like to get wild, but love my slow dances. So anyway, my point being, always been romantic at heart. And so there was Katie. And I understand, I wasn't asking God for a booty call. I was asking him for a woman to love, like a, a girlfriend. I mean, I wasn't trying to get married or anything like that, but I wanted a romantic relationship. And boy, did he come through and deliver that summer. Katie King, definitely my summer wins. So God, thanks again for that. And then there was Summer Lamb, beautiful Summer Lamb, who is from Hawaii. I met her uh, in some bar in Long Beach when I was doing IT headhunting. And I actually took out this guy that I was trying to place. He was an original uh, cybersecurity hacker of sorts. And that's where I met Summer. So Summer was super cool, was into Metallica. Her vision for us was that I should give up the headhunting so I could just like write novels in Santa Barbara while she day traded. Yeah. 
beautiful uh, image, I know. So, uh, Summer, uh, you were wonderful. And you were a great friend. And I love you for that forever. And I haven't mentioned this podcast yet. And I know that I offended you by sharing some old jokes I'm not going to repeat right now on the podcast. But, you know, you, you, were, you were definitely a loving, great friend. And I got scared off because you were giving me a very loving look that I knew deep down that I would never be able to replicate. I know it's an awful excuse, but I love what we had together. And you're a beautiful human being. And I'm really glad that you're thriving as a chiropractor in Hawaii. I'm not stalking you online, but I did do a search about like eight years ago because I was just curious. So I'm so glad you are thriving because you're smart, you're beautiful. God gave you the entire enchilada. So really glad that uh, you're back home. And our summer together in Hermosa was great. Katie, obviously, you know, our summer in Cape Cod was uh, was remarkable. You know, it was that summer where you said that I never knew someone could make me so happy. And you gave me that gift from God, you know, which is at that point in my life, proving to me that I possess the capacity, the potential to make someone so happy, specifically a woman. And that was a major hang-up of mine for a long time. My younger brother losing, losing his virginity before I did and going through puberty. And me at the time, and then him banging the three hottest girls in his class, me trying to trick off to all those girls at the time, but couldn't, which made me feel like a real big brother. Bust of sorts. So, and then I, I did surprise Katie. Uh, it was not planned at all. When I drove cross country before I spent my last semester in LA, and we had a very passionate embrace, uh, I I might have told my wife this. I'm not trying to you know keep any any secrets here. It wasn't a sign of us like getting back together or anything. For me, it just solidified the fact or the feeling that what we had was real, and uh, that was a very passionate embrace. So that that was a beautiful moment. So you know, Katie, um, I have no idea what you're doing right now, but uh, want to thank you again for that gift of God that he channeled through you, which was you teaching me that I can make some so happy. I obviously see that with my children on a regular basis. Uh, when I start making money again on the home front, I like to think that uh, my wife will uh, be a recipient of those sort of effusive, uh, giddy gazes, and I won't have to tolerate any more accusations of me being excessively hostile, which apparently, in this day and age, you're not allowed to be curt with your answers or uh, make any sort of stompage that basically is above, uh, you know, Richard Gere getting, you know, uh, dribbled again. So, but um, my wife, Mitayana Duffy, I love you. Obviously, I don't want hostility to be the, the hallmark of our relationship these days. Mother of my children, and you've been my biggest booster ever. You are that lucky number three, the one that I had that vision of, that I would meet on the island of Manhattan, which I did. I mentioned the story before, but we met on Barry Diller's balcony overlooking Central Park. We met in his Tower of Love. Barry Diller is a major mogul. He ran the Fox Network when Simpsons became what it was. He also founded IAC, Interactive Corp. So he had absorbed uh, Ask Jeeves. City Search, where I was doing ad sales. My wife was an executive assistant working for one of his big shots in charge of mergers and acquisitions. That's where we met. And I was able to sound cool that night because I had a friend from San Diego named Cedric. Cedric, I love you. I know we've talked, we haven't talked in ages. He was visiting. So I was able to sound semi cool and say, I had a friend visiting from San Diego. Would you like to extend you know, this time together downtown? Sure, no problem. And the rest is history. So, uh, so what, what's my message here today, folks? What is my message? My message is, is that if you've had your heart broken and if you felt completely lonely and, and helpless, thinking nothing's going to break, the, uh, my advice for you is that things do and that it doesn't hurt to ask the big man upstairs, whatever phrase you want to use, God, your Lord, it doesn't hurt to ask him for a favor as long as you're very sincere in your intentions. And you're not like a complete selfish you know, greedy, uh, heap about it. <laughs> so uh, that goes a long way. So uh, thank you, Lord, for delivering for me when you have. So uh, I love all of you listeners. I love any future interest in Do It All Dads that want to be interviewed on the Do It All Dad Year podcast. This is your host, Michael Kornbluth, for the Do It All Dad Year podcast, dad-friendly entertainment for you and me, controlling our kids, 
through comedy can make our kids great again. Talk to you soon.